The title of today's sermon is A Crucial Power of Intercessory Prayer. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm a senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. God is awesome and amazing. Last week, we learned that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, James 5, 16. As we draw near and approach God's throne of grace, we as the living sacrifices and his children not only receive forgiveness, and we always need that, but we also get an opportunity to get in front of God and say, you are the potter, we are the clay, please mold us, please shape us, keep changing us, because we're not where we should be. None of us really are. Let's be honest about that. We all have areas and components of our lives that we've given over to Jesus 100%. But there's also other parts of our lives that we have not yet given over to Christ. And we need God the Father in heaven to change us, to mold us, to make us more like him every single day. That's why in Romans chapter number 12, it starts off and says, May we allow God, or invite God, I should say, to renew our minds on a daily basis so that we might become more like him. That's absolutely critical. We also learned, though, last week that the prayers that we have shouldn't be all about us. To keep our prayers from becoming the product of self-ambition or, or vain conceit, I think we need to fulfill God's command. We've got to love each other. And if we're going to love one another, then we got to pray for one another. And I think that's absolutely critical. You know, Jesus asked, you know, who ultimately is the neighbor? And Jesus said, you know what? He said, everybody is. Everybody that we meet is our neighbor. Every single individual that God sends our way is our neighbor. And we're supposed to love them and cherish them. And we're supposed to pray for them. You know what? That's a really big command. And Jesus said, I want you to love everybody and to pray for one another. What a big command that is. Because while we don't mind praying for believers, that's really easy because they believe in God and we believe in God and they have similar goals to what we have. It's really hard, isn't it, to pray for our rulers? We don't always agree with the rulers of the nations, do we? Sometimes they believe in God, but often they don't. And as a result of that, there's a big schism between us and them. And when they start doing up policies and ideas that are different than ours or different than what God would say is okay, there's a wedge, isn't there, between us and them. And what about our enemies who come out and they say, I don't like you. I'm going to go against you. I want to destroy you. What do we do with those kind of individuals? Well, Scripture says we're supposed to love them. We're supposed to pray for them and not pray to destroy them, but pray a blessing for them. I think this is absolutely critical. Now, if you missed this first part of the sermon that I did the other week, please go on the website. There's a spot in there for sermon histories or sermon archives. You can go in there and you can play that sermon first. I'm going to go on to part two of this sermon. I'm going to go into a little bit more about prayer because I do think there's some areas that I need to, to expound upon. The following sermon is going to further define intercessory prayer by examining its boundaries and its effectiveness. For example, when Jesus said, ask anything in my name, I will do it. What does that mean? I hear an awful lot of Christians who will quote this verse, John 14, 13, and will say, if you ask anything in my name, Jesus said, I will do it. So that means anything I ask you, Lord, no matter what it is, you're going to do it. Well, we can't take that literally because obviously if we ask Jesus for a million dollars, he's not necessarily going to give us that. Or if we ask him to give us something that is actually a sin, he's definitely not going to give us that. This verse is very, very easily misunderstood if it's taken out of context. And if we don't look at the entire scripture to try to figure out what all the scripture says about asking for things from God, then we're going to get bad conclusions. I got thinking about how difficult this verse actually is. And I got thinking, how is it possible, if we take this verse literally, how is it possible that everything we ask in the name of Jesus we receive, would that not ultimately make God's sovereignty mute? Would we not be in charge? Would not God become a mere puppet of our whims and our imaginations? Of course he would, if everything we asked in Jesus' name we got. And since God's ways and thoughts are higher than our ways, how could he remain holy when following the ways of his redeemed but still unrighteous children? In other words, if we asked for a whole bunch of things in Jesus' name, would we always ask with the right motives? Would we always ask for those things that are holy, righteous, and true? And the answer is no. 
And if God grants those things to us, then obviously that's not a good thing. On the other hand, though, if God says, I have written everything down in a book concerning you, and we find that in Psalms 139, then why pray? If God says, you know what, if you pray, then I'm never going to change anything in your life, period. No matter what you ask for, the answer is always going to be, no, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Then why do we pray in the first place? See the conundrum? And there is one here. How can God grant our prayers and still say, stay sovereign, but at the same time, if he doesn't grant some of our prayers, then why would we pray at all? And I want to deal with this issue because I think a lot of Christians are confused when it comes to prayer and how we make our requests and how they are granted to us. The first two parts of the sermon are going to give examples. First, I'm going to give you examples of when intercessory prayer did not work. In other words, you prayed for something and God said no. And no matter what you said, it was still no. Then I'm going to go to the next part and I'm going to look at places where God in intercessory prayer said yes. And you asked for something and God said absolutely and he granted it to you. And then in the third part, I'm going to deal with how can God grant our request and still remain sovereign? And are there conditions to get our prayers answered a yes and what are those conditions? So we can get rid of some of this confusion. And that's what we're going to look at. But first, let's take a look at Jeremiah. And I think this is one of the very best examples out there, I think, of a no. Jeremiah was a prophet, okay? You know what? Being a prophet wouldn't be a lot of fun. Because if God come knocking on your door and said, oh, by the way, I want you to be a prophet. Uh, if you're going to ask me to be an Old Testament prophet, I'm not sure if I'm going to really like this. Because the reality is, is that the prophet always went to the people and said, these are the areas that you're not doing so well. God wants you to repent of these sins and get back on the right track or he's going to punish you. And of course, the people never feel like they're sinning. You know, when you read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they're always in denial. They're always sitting back saying, you know what, we're doing exactly what God wants. What are you talking about? We're not sinning. And it's always the prophet who gets persecuted because they make the suggestion that, yes, you are. Jeremiah was approximately 12 or 13 when he was called to be a prophet of the Most High God. Well, we have the very first uh, few years of his ministry was absolutely amazing because he was under the uh, King Josiah was the king at the time. Josiah was around 622. And Josiah, if you remember him from the Old Testament, he was all about reform. He was all about getting Israel back on the right track. He was all about getting Israel to repent of their sins, get rid of the high places and all their foreign gods and only have but one God. Obviously, Jeremiah comes along during that time period at the start of his ministry, and he's saying the same thing that Josiah the king is saying. So he's not getting a whole lot of persecution. Nobody really dared touch Jeremiah during that time period because he had the protection of the king who was saying the same things. However, that's not how his ministry ended at all. Jeremiah's uh, prophetic uh, message of repentance later on under the kings of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah resulted in big time persecution for him because neither one of those kings wanted to follow God. Both of those kings did their own thing in their own way. And as a result of that, every time Jeremiah came up and said, look, if you don't repent, God's about to destroy all of Judah. They just kind of laughed and said, go away. You're bothering us. We don't believe you. We don't think you're right. The complaint God had against his people at the time of these kings, though, is that they'd gone up on every single high hill and under every spreading tree, and they committed adultery, Jeremiah 3.6. They were unfaithful, Jeremiah 3.1. They harbored so many wicked thoughts that they had become so skilled in doing evil, Scripture says, that they did not know how to do good. Wow, Jeremiah 14, uh, 4, verses 14 and 22. Instead of listening to the prophet's plea that Judah circumcised their hearts, lest God turn his fierce anger upon them and, and turn their whole land in, that it was fruitful at the time into an absolute desert, not a single person, it says in Scripture, could be found who would deal honestly. Not one person could be found who would seek God's truth in the matter at all. This is what Jeremiah was facing. And it was really a tough thing for him to look at. Okay, now, here's the thing. The prophet did an awful lot of crying. There's no doubt about that. Despite intercessory prayer on behalf of the people being one of the primary roles of a prophet, God was 
so angry with his people that he told Jeremiah this. Look at, just take a look at the screen. Do not pray. Do not pray for this people. He said, do not offer any plea or petition for them. In other words, don't try to argue with me. Don't appeal to my mercy. Don't appeal to my hesed or my love. Don't appeal to anything else because my answer is no. Don't plead with me for I'm not going to listen to you, God said to Jeremiah. In other words, he gave him this really big warning. He says, I know you love them. I know you want the best for them. I know you don't want me to destroy them, but I am going to regardless of what you ever say. Even when Jeremiah prayed and cited God's justice as a reason why he shouldn't punish the evil people of Anatha, for instance, who are trying to kill him, Jeremiah got another no. So you got, here you got this prophet, Jeremiah, who goes to God and he says, oh, by the way, my own people are trying to kill me and they got this plot to get rid of me. And he says, I'm looking for some justice here, God. And God said, not only am I not going to answer your prayer, but also I am going to attack Jerusalem. I'm going to have them attacked. And on top of that, your situation in the future is going to be worse than what it is now. Can you imagine poor Jeremiah? Wait, God, I was looking for relief. I was looking for salvation for my people and myself. I was looking for good days. But you're telling me bad days are coming. Really bad ones. And right now is actually a good day compared to what we're going to have soon. What we learn from Jeremiah is once God decides to act decisively in history, then nobody has the right or the ability to question or to change a sovereign act and divine authority to rule all things seen and unseen. In other words, there are points in time when God is going to say, no, no, I'm not doing that. No, no matter how much you plead or beg, no matter what argument you use, the answer is going to be no. Remember, this was Jeremiah prophet. Now, that's not the only example of where God has said no inside of scripture. There are many other ones. There are lots of instances where God said no. And I want, to, I want to say, these are some of the greatest people in the Bible. These are really big names in the Bible. So you might say, you know what, Pastor, maybe it's because they didn't have enough prayer uh, or enough faith. Or maybe it's because they asked for the wrong motives. Or maybe, or maybe, or maybe. No, the answer is God sometimes just says no, period. No matter what the circumstances, it's still a no. For example, Samuel was told that God regretted making Saul king of Israel. Despite crying out to the Lord, all night, this is what God told him. He said, stop mourning for Saul. Get up, fill your horn with oil, go anoint David as king. In other words, I made up my mind, God said to Samuel. You are my prophet. And Samuel was a great prophet. There's no question. One of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. But God told him, stop mourning for him. Stop praying for him. I have made up my mind. David is going to be the king that's going to take over for Saul. Now go do your job. Go do what I asked you to do. This is your calling. This is the calling that I have in front of you. Samuel, go and anoint David. Can you imagine? Despite Jonah fleeing the Lord and then later praying that he would die because God showed compassion and mercy on the evil inhabitants of Nineveh, God would not regret grant its request. So here you got Jonah sitting out in a desert. God has saved Nineveh, and he's very mad and angry at this time because he didn't think Nineveh deserved to be saved. And he's out in this desert, and he's saying, God, just let me die. I don't want to live anymore. And God said to him, no, I'm not going to let you die. No, that's just not the way things are going to go. Though King David pleaded with God, fasted, and spent seven days and night in a sackcloth on the ground, his request that God would forego his punishment and spare his first child with Bethsaida was denied denied can you imagine it says in scriptures that david was a man after god's own heart that david was very close and it says that in many places in scriptures david was very close to god and yet god told david no no i am punishing you for what you and Bethsaida did no i'm not going to spare this child and it was a no no matter what david said to him when Balak asked Balaam to ask God to curse Israel, God not only said no, but gave Israel a blessing through Balaam. When Elijah, who was afraid of Jezebel's wrath, sat under a juniper tree and asked God to take his life, he was told no, for God had something far better in mind, the calling of Elisha to replace him later on, but also the idea that Elijah wasn't going to die physically. God was going to take him up into heaven in a big old chariot, and he would never taste death. 
you know what? God had a better plan for him. Let's look at Apostle Paul. And when I think about Paul, I think, you know what? This guy is great. He was one that was filled with faith. He is a pillar in the New Testament. So you would think that whatever Apostle Paul would ask would automatically be granted, especially when he asked in Jesus' name. And the answer was, no, Paul didn't get everything he asked for. Apostle Paul prayed three times that God would remove the messenger of Satan or the thorn and God, from his side. And God's response was, no, no, I'm not going to do that. No, all three times. He said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The answer is no, you will keep your thorn. Starting to see the, the pattern here. When the rich man in hell interceded on behalf of his family by asking God to send Lazarus to warn his family, you don't want to go where I am. I'm sitting in hell because of all the bad things I did and I didn't acknowledge God. He said, can you send Lazarus to tell him that message? And God said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bother doing that because they won't believe. They didn't believe in the prophets. They're certainly not going to believe in Lazarus, even if he's raised from the dead and he goes back and tells them. They're still not going to believe, period. Okay, so sometimes God says no. And no matter what faith we have, no matter what argument we use, no matter how much we appeal to his mercy or his hesed or to anything else, his answer will always be a no. Okay, that's the first part of the sermon. Phew, that was the hard part, actually. You know, nobody likes to deal with the no part. Let's go on to the yes part, because that's, that's a lot more fun. But before I leave that part, I just want to say one more thing. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, I will do. Obviously, in the first part of this sermon, I basically said there is confidence that we can have in Jesus Christ, that whatever we ask in his name, he will do as long as we do it according to his will. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but hang on to this thought as I go into the next section. His will matters, very much so. Jesus will not do anything that breaks his will. And we, I'm going to talk about that and how that plays into this sermon on intercessory prayer. Okay, but just hang on that thought. There's some conditions for our prayers to be given a yes. Hang on to that. Okay, now let's look at when God says yes. And I think this is, is really important. I got a whole bunch of different examples, examples of intercessory prayer that was granted. Even though God sometimes says no, there are a lot of times in which God will say, yes, I will do that for you when you pray for it. When Moses cried out to God to save Israel from the pursuing Egyptian army, we know that he raised up his staff. God told him to do it. And then God parted the seas and the Israelite people went across on dry ground. God said yes to his request. In response to Elisha's request that God would save them, ultimately from King Aram's wrath. Not only were his servants' eyes open to witness the hills filled with horses and chariots of fire, but the Lord also struck an entire army helpless by blindness. Wow, that's a response to prayer. In response to Hezekiah's pleas that God would save them from the Assyrian army that was threatening to destroy Jerusalem. God sent an angel of the Lord and he went out and he put to death 185,000 of the Assyrian camp and they all fleed, whatever few were left. Oh my goodness, God said yes and he certainly answered that prayer. In response to the fasting, weeping, and wailing of the Jews over King Xerxes' decree to annihilate their nation, God said yes to the request and not only saved them, in other words, got Xerxes to change his mind and not annihilate the nation, but at the same time also had the perpetrator, Haman, impelled upon a pole. When Samson prayed that God would return his strength, God said, absolutely. And you can see that in the bottom picture there. God said, yes, I'll give your strength back for a moment. And then, of course, we know he took down the uh, whole building on his enemies. God said yes to him and many Philistines perished because God wanted to punish them. When the centurion went up to Jesus, now this is a Roman soldier and he's an officer and he goes up to Jesus and he says, you know what? I have a servant, one that I love very dearly, and he's about to die. And he said, will you heal him? You don't need to come to my house. I know that. You just need to command it. Remember what Jesus said? Oh my goodness, you've got great faith. And at that moment, his servant was healed. So Jesus said yes, even to a Gentile centurion. When a father pleaded with Jesus to heal his son possessed by an impure spirit, he said yes, and he not only commanded the spirit to come out, but Jesus also said, spirit, you can never go back there again. In other words, you can't go repossess this father's son. When a synagogue leader 
pleaded earnestly for Jesus to heal his dying daughter. While she did die, Christ went to the home, raised her from the dead, and she lived. My goodness, can you imagine? And when the church earnestly prayed to God to save Peter from King Herod's prison, God said, yes, sent an angel. The chains fell off of Peter's arms and he walked out through all the guards. And he actually shows up at the house of the church in which they were praying. And he shows up, knocks on the door and says, here I am. Can you imagine how excited those people must have been to see a miracle happen as they're praying for that miracle? So the answer here is, yes, there's a lots of occasions where God actually says yes to prayer, where he says, yes, I will give you what you have asked for. Now, I want to look at one more instance here, and I think this one's really important. And this one here is Moses. And I think this is incredibly important. Not only has God granted many requests, but he also has changed his mind in the course of action in response to prayer. A great example of God relenting, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, a decision can be found in the story of the golden calf. Since Moses took a long time on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, the Israelites grew restless. They started thinking, what happened to Moses? Where did he go? Did he die up on that mountain? Did he run away because we complained too much? Or did he just run away because he didn't like the responsibility? Where did Moses actually go? He's long gone. We don't have our leader the one who used to talk to God on our behalf and in return told us the things that God had. So they got really scared. And as a result of that, they went to Aaron and they told Aaron, will you make us a golden calf? Will you make us an image of a calf? Make it in gold and then we're going to worship that calf is the idea. One almost gets whiplash when you're reading the book of Exodus. Because as you're reading along, you hear about these 10 plagues of Egypt and you think, Oh my goodness, you've had 10 plagues of Egypt. You went to the Red Sea and God parted that sea for you. You've had so many miracles in your life. Surely you believe 100% in whatever God has to say. Surely you trust them fully. And the answer was no, they did not trust God fully. And the very second they hit a bump in the road, of course, they turn away from God and they decide they're going to worship a golden calf. Can you imagine? You almost get whiplash when you're reading the story because you would think they would be faithful, but they weren't. Well, on the mountain, God breaks the news to Moses. He says, oh, by the way, Moses, as we're getting these Ten Commandments and God's writing them with his finger, he says, oh, by the way, the people down there, my people, Moses' people, they're actually breaking all my laws. They're actually gone and done their own thing. They have disgraced me. They've gone against me. And he said, you know what? My anger burns against them. Even though God pr proved time and time again to be strong enough to deliver Israel from her enemies, it seems like in Israel's mind, God was not strong enough to win over their hearts because obviously he had not. God's anger, it says in scriptures, burns so intense over these stiff-necked people, that's what he called them, and that he told Moses, I'm going to destroy them all. I'm going to destroy every single Israelite person that is down there, the entire nation, and I'm going to start all over again with you, Moses. You're the only one that I see that's righteous. That's it. All the rest I'm going to annihilate, including Aaron. All of them. Can you imagine poor Moses? He was standing there deeply in love with Israel, wishing that none of them get destroyed or annihilated. Moses decides that he's going to appeal to God. You know this has not been done necessarily in Scripture. We don't have a lot of instances where there is an appeal that is made. But in this case, here's the appeal. Moses goes in front of God and he says, you know what? I want to appeal to your reputation. What would the, what would the Egyptian people think? You know, you, you are powerful enough to get them out of Egypt, but you weren't powerful enough to save them in the desert? Really? Then you can't be that powerful, God. So he appeals to his reputation in front of the world. And then he goes on, and he says, I'm also going to appeal the promise. You made a promise, God, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You made a promise that their descendants would be numerous as the stars in the sky. How are their descendants going to be like that if you're going to annihilate them all? That's quite an appeal that he makes. He makes that appeal. And he even went as far to make the final appeal, which is really a big one. And he said, you know what? God, if you have to block my name out of the book of light, life. In other words, take my name that's in the book of life. You erase that. You get rid of that. I'll spend an eternity in hell if you just let them live. Wow. Talk about an appeal. You know what? The reality is, is that did this work? Did this actually work? Did God actually change his mind? 
And he did according to scriptures. It says he relented and, and he did not wipe them off the face of the earth. He decided instead that he would, would basically punish them, but not destroy them. Had Moses not interceded on behalf of, of the people of Israel? I think the Bible's very clear here. God would have destroyed them. Yes. So God, it seems like here, had two paths. Either A, destroy Israel, or B, punish Israel. And it seems like Moses got him to choose one path over the other. Hang on to that thought, because we're going to talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to talk about right now the key. What have we learned from these two sections? What is the key to getting a yes from God? I've already told you that there's instances where God's going to say no. No matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter how we plead or beg, God is still going to say, no, I'm not doing that. No, you're not getting that. There are other instances, though, that we go in front of God, and obviously he says, yes, absolutely, I will do that for you. I agree 100%. We're on board. I'm on board with you. And it seems like for Moses, there is a possibility that God might have a couple of paths that he might choose the one that we pray for. But let me talk first and foremost about the key to getting a yes from God. There are many conditions in scriptures, and I've just listed some of them. I think I have the major ones here for us to get a yes. Number one, we've, when we make a request to God, we've got to make a request that is good for us from God's perspective and not from ours. In other words, God, who created the entire universe, knows everything about the universe, knows everything about us, knows exactly what is good for us inside of his kingdom. We must ask in accordance to that goodness. In other words, if we go to God and say, oh, by the way, I want you to make me a millionaire. And if he knows that that's going to make us conceited and make us, you know, love money too much and make us sin a whole bunch, then obviously he's not going to do that. So the first one is whatever we ask for must be for our good from God's point of view. The second one is we've got to ask in Jesus name, whatever our requests are, it has to be according to Jesus. Jesus is the one who grants our request. The next one is, we've got to ask without having sin within our hearts, or cherishing sin, it says in Psalms. We can't cherish sin, because if we do, Scripture says God won't hear us. So that's an impediment. It has to be made in faith. If we're going to ask God for something, we've got to have faith. We've got to believe that God can actually do it. And the next one is, we've got to ask with the right motives. And that's kind of a little bit like the request must be good for us. We've got to ask with motives that are pure, focused on God and his kingdom and not focused on us or destroying other people. And the last one is, and this one's really important, we have to ask in accordance with God's will. In other words, whatever his will is, whatever he wants, we must ask in his will. Okay, those are the points that we really need to focus on. But I want to finish with this. And here's a tough question. Does God change his mind? I want to go back to Moses and I want to finish with this. Does God change his mind? That's a tough question, isn't it? If we pray to God, would he actually change his mind? The answer is both a no and a yes, all at the same time. God is holy, and since his ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and thoughts, to relent would mean to introduce imperfection into he who is without a flaw. So first off, the answer is no, we can't necessarily go to God and pray to him and always get a request made and, and make sure that it's always going to happen. The answer is no. God is sovereign. And God is going to do whatever is righteous, holy, and pure. So that's the first thing. So how do we reconcile, though, with Scripture when it clearly states that God relented his decision to destroy Israel when Moses appealed to his reputation and the promises to make Abraham, Isaac, and Israel into a great nation. How do we, how do we reconcile that? Because it seems like God changed his mind. Let us first humbly state that we don't want to be like Job. We don't want to do the same mistake that Job did anyway. And Job made the mistake of going in front of God and say, come on down here, justify your decisions before me. The reality is, is that we wouldn't stand any better than Job did when God came down in the whirlwind. Remember, he said, brace yourself like a man. If you dare, if you dare stand tall and you answer my questions. And of course, God asked him a whole bunch of things about the universe of which Job knew nothing about. And Job had to say, look, I, I spoke out of turn. We don't want to do that. We don't want to get in front of God and say, oh, by the way, whatever your decisions are, Lord, I'm going to question them all. I'm going to say they're all wrong. We don't dare do that because we're not God. However, 
let us not forget that to balance out his justice, his compassion, and his mercy, God's will often contains, from what we see in, from Moses' story, more than one path. And there's always that possibility. While one cannot change the historical path written for the universe by God before the beginning of time, one certainly can and ought to intercede with prayers of tears, persistence, and perseverance when it comes to the uh, daily lives of oneself and that of others. When God was about to destroy Judah, he said he would have chosen a different path. He would have picked a different way if somebody could have been found that could have convinced the nation to repent as a whole and stop doing the things that they were doing. But nobody could be found. Jeremiah wasn't able to do it. He tried. It's not like he didn't try. He certainly, when he was in the cistern or in the well, and he's looking up, and of course they cast him in there because he was saying, you know, you need to repent. He certainly gave it an effort. But in the end, nobody could be found anywhere on the earth that could convince Jerusalem at that time to repent. God made it very clear. If there had been somebody who could convince them, then he would have picked a different path. In other words, instead of giving his judgment on them and destroying them and putting them out into exile in Babylon, he would have picked another path. The punishment would have been far less severe. And of course, the people would have been blessed. While God sometimes says a definite no, that's unalterable, that is never going to change because it's part of his sovereign plan, I think ultimately there are times when God has more than one path. He has a path if we ask him, if we ask him in the right way, with the right motives, with great faith, if we ask him because it is good for us and it actually aligns with his kingdom. If we ask him, sometimes there's another path that he's going to pick. He has two, depending on what we do. And I think that's important for us to understand. So let us never stop praying that God will plow furrows of righteousness in our hearts, other believers' hearts, the rulers of this world, and even our enemies' hearts. For the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let's never forget that God is God. Yes, there are times that God's going to say no. And we're just going to have to get over that. The reality is that he is sovereign. And there's no possibility whatsoever that a sovereign God is going to do something he doesn't want to do. He's going to do what is righteous, what is holy, what is perfect. He's going to do out of love and mercy and kindness to us. But ultimately, he has a grand plan. And we know that in the book of Revelation. Whatever that plan is, and we don't know all the details of it, he's going to follow that plan regardless of what we say or what we do. Absolutely. Amen. However, there are times, though, when God does give us the opportunity to take one path or another depending on how we respond to a given situation. So I think we should be praying all the time. I think we should be praying that we know God's good and perfect and wonderful will, because obviously that's one of the criterias of getting a yes. And I think that we should pray to God for the absolute best in our lives, because he's going to do good for us anyway. And I think we should pray for him, Lord, mold me, shape me, change me, make me more like you, because that's all I really want. That's all I need, Lord. I need to be more like you. Those kind of prayers always get answered with a yes. Always a yes. So somebody comes up and asks you and they say, you know what, if you pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're always going to get it. You can say, that's a yes and that's a no. Yes and no. Sometimes you're absolutely right, but other times, no, you're not. God is God and he's awesome and amazing. And thank goodness he doesn't say yes to everything we ask him for. Because if he did, oh my goodness, our lives would be so messed up. And thank goodness he only gives us good things, good things for all of us. So let us pray. Let's pray for each other. Let's first start praying for ourselves that God would change us. But let us pray for the rulers and our enemies and believers and everyone that God sends our way. Because God wants to hear our prayers. He wants us to speak them. He wants us to say them to to him. Not that he doesn't already know what we need. He wants us to humbly come before him and ask. And if we ask according to his will and great faith, we ask with the right motives. If we ask for something that is good for us and aligns up with his kingdom, then we're always going to get a yes. But when we do get a no, it's for our good or it's part of his kingdom. We just got to accept it. We got to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, because you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Praise be to God. I hope and pray that you have an absolutely beautiful, wonderful day. And again, this sermon is online. I encourage you very much so to go online. 
you, you just went in and you watched the video. Well, there's a couple other icons there. There's an icon where you can either get a PDF document of this or a Word document. I want to encourage you to take either one of those. Uh, bring them up on your screen and print them off because I've got a lot of scripture in there and scripture on every single word that I pretty much said here. And there's a whole bunch of commentary references. So please dive in, dive in and understand this crucial part of God's word because prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective when done in accordance with his word. Amen.